preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm Vivian Siegel. I'm a member of the Y Board of Directors and coordinator of the morning lecture series. And I want to welcome you, all you old friends, and our new friends, to this new series. You know, when we plan in the fall, for in the spring, rather, for a fall series, we hope that issues will be sufficiently current to excite all of you. Well, in the light of what's going on in the world, we certainly picked a few hot issues, but today's issue on inflation is almost like comic relief. Sometimes, of course, a topic dies on us. For example, Jim Jensen, who's speaking on another series, was going to talk about the mayoralty election and the media. Well, <laughs> that was, uh, is not exactly a, an exciting topic at this moment. So he's going to talk instead on how, over the past 10 years, the media, and especially TV news, have affected the climate of the country so that a Watergate is possible. And this should be fascinating. And uh, if you can attend that single lecture on November 13th, which is a Tuesday morning, do come. Now on to our speaker. Our procedure is that we reserve questions until after the lecture. We're living in a period when phase four does not refer to early childhood development. For a clarification of what it does refer to, we couldn't be in better hands than our speakers. You may have noticed that whenever any statistical interpretation of labor trends or the cost of living becomes front page news, it is our speaker who is making the statement an economist, he's been regional director of the Labor Statistics Bureau of the Department of Labor, the United States Department of Labor, since 1962, and is responsible for directing research activities in the states of New Jersey, New York, uh, the Virgin Islands, the Canal Zone, in matters relating to manpower, wages, prices, and so on. He's listed in various who's who, has taught at Cornell and other universities, at the American Institute of Banking, has been on countless national advisory committees, and I don't know how he's found the time to publish as much as he has, or to counsel so many organizations on various subjects, such as the changing labor market for women, or the implications of ecology on manpower. He also has to take time out to receive the most prestigious awards, which are granted him not only because he makes statistics come alive, but because he's really concerned with the people behind the statistics. I take great ple pleasure in presenting Herbert Beanstalk. Well, thank you for that generous introduction. As usual, when I hear that recounting of events, it reminds me of uh, Oscar Wilde's comments when he was brought to look at uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, he stared at it and stared at it and then shook his head and he said, very impressive, but it would uh, be more so if it ran the other way. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I must say that uh, being here at the uh, 92nd Street Y this morning leaves me a little overwhelmed with nostalgia because uh, this is where I spent a good part of my teenage years uh, with a counselor by the name of Mitchell Ginsburg. He's a fellow who was a former human resource administrator. Uh, he learned all about social work practicing on me at the 92nd Street Y. So, <laughs> and as I said to uh, uh, Vivian Siegel, I haven't been back in 35 years, I'm ashamed to say. At any rate, um, uh, the, uh, the matter of uh, current issues uh, 
is always an intriguing one. I, I think that uh, when it comes to cost of living, you never have to worry about whether it's going to continue to be a cost of uh, a current issue. You can almost schedule that for any time. It's uh, much, uh, I suppose, like uh, uh, the uh, presumed comment that uh, Mark Twain is supposed to have made about uh, what everyone talks about in terms of the weather. Uh, now, phase four, I, I'm just uh, looking at a few notes I made in terms of uh, Vivian Siegel's introduction, and then I'd like to get on to the subject in which I'm going to use that set of charts that I see are all, all clutching in your hands there, this uh, yellow book, in which uh, uh, the young lady who helps me on these things and made the, uh, the front cover up insisted on leaving off the S you notice it says the cost, some facts relate to the cost of living, but the presumed subject of this uh, morning is uh, some facts uh, is the cost of living. Uh, it simply, you know, demonstrates the way some people get very parochial. And we have this little thing called the cost of uh, living index. Uh, but I, I did want to get this off my chest. Uh, Vivian Siegel suggested that I was... Uh, uh, perhaps uh, well equipped to tell you about uh, phase four, or I think um, uh, the way she put it, according to my note here, is you couldn't be in better hands. You know, as it's sometimes put, that's probably more a, a comment on the state of the art than it is on my knowledge, uh, because uh, when it comes to phase four, I suspect that there are a lot of people who uh, simply are wondering uh, what it is all about. But maybe uh, we can kind of end with that in terms of uh, understanding that, after all, uh, uh, phase four and phase one and two and three uh, were all a response to a set of circumstances. And um, hopefully, uh, as when you're in the hands of a physician, and uh, we economists are, I suppose, not really uh, that much um, <clears throat> more versed in the practice of uh, the application of uh, remediation and medication than uh, the other folks. Uh, but uh, when you're in the hands of a physician, you're hopeful that he's applying medicine that relates to the illness. Uh, the best of medicine isn't going to succeed very well. In fact, may throw things out of kilter if it's being applied to a, an illness that is simply not related to the medication. So what I thought I'd do with you this morning, if I may, is uh, run through a little bit of the background of what has occurred. Maybe we can uh, end on the uh, issues which I suppose are in everybody's mind, as, as always, that is, uh, where are we going? Well, uh, economists being a, or statisticians, a very logical bunch, I'm going to start on page one, if I can ask you to join me there. Uh, it's probably the last logical thing I'll do this morning. Now, I thought on page one I would simply try to uh, introduce the notion uh, that um, this business of cost of living is a very complicated matter, as I guess we've all learned ever since uh, we were youngsters. And um, for one thing, uh, you are uh, bombarded once a month, I suspect, over the air with this announcement that, you know, the cost of living has gone up one-tenth of one percent or two-tenths of one percent or recently a little more than that. And uh, I suspect that you, uh, like my wife, must wonder, what is this guy talking about? You know, you know damn well that your cost of living has been gone up a lot more uh, than what we're reporting. And I, I want to tell you uh, right in here and now that uh, that is quite likely to be the case because the figures that are reported each month that are presumed to be uh, a report on the cost of living, uh, down deep in the footnotes that are you know generally ignored because there's a vast distance. I don't mean to sound like a recent gentleman who occupied the august office of vice president, but there is a, uh, a great distance between the footnotes and the headlines. And in the footnotes, this Bureau of Labor Statistics is uh, continuously reporting that uh, this is a consumer price index. And of course, it's being reported continuously as a cost of living index. Now, what's the difference between these two concepts? Um, Simply this, that prices are really only one part 
of what changes your cost of living. If I may offer a uh, simple illustration, if uh, an arrow shirt has gone in price from $6 to $7.50, you can see how outdated my illustrations are. Uh, it, it, it's an increase of what? Six to $7.50 is 25%. Uh, now, a, a Gantt shirt, perhaps at that same period of time, uh, went from $9 to $12, and that's an increase of what? 33%. But what is also what tends to happen to us as we move through the chronology of life uh, not only do we um, you know add a few more children a couple of more television sets a few additional cars and the like as uh, we uh, become more able to acquire these material things uh, but we tend also uh, for those of us who are able to to step up the manners and styles of living and so maybe you switch from an arrow shirt to a Gantt shirt. And so if you go from the $6 arrow shirt, not to the $7.50 one with a 25% increase in price, which is certainly substantial enough, but you go from the $6 Gantt shirt to the $12, I'm sorry, from the $6 arrow shirt to the $12 Gantt shirt. Now each of those items has only gone up 25%, 33%, What's happened to your cost of living if you go from a six to a twelve dollar item? It's gone up a hundred percent, and and really that's what your pocketbook is feeling, while the index keeps reporting one element of price change, and that is uh, one element of cost of living change, and that is price change. Well, <clears throat> now I'm not sure. I did want to make that point early in the game, but I'm not now entirely sure how it relates to this chart. On, on page one, all I'm trying to suggest with the chart on page one, that is in terms of measuring prices, however, the uh, consumer price index, which is still the best uh, gauge of inflationary movements, because changes in living costs of the kind I've described are really quite difficult to measure. Uh, price change is much simpler to measure, even though that's quite difficult. But in terms of price change, uh, we have an index that uh, really uh, covers a sort of a cradle to grave uh, array. And you'll notice here, apparently, uh, since 1967, if you look at that chart on page one, when we've had this period of galloping inflation, uh, apparently uh, we've done a better, a little better in the cradle. And, and I'm sorry, no, forgive me. You know, this is perhaps typical of life. It seems to be easier to go than to come. And, uh, although that hasn't, to be honest with you, matched my experience. Maybe that's why I had the slip of the tongue. At any rate, it looks like the obstetricians have been doing a little better than the morticians. Although, notice, not so much recently. Notice how the... Uh, Incidentally, that reflects what's been happening to medical care prices. There's been a kind of a leveling off at the tail end of the period. But really, chart one there is thrown in more for amusement than, uh, than I think, enlightenment. Let me ask you to turn to page two and three, if you just open them together, perhaps. Uh, here's a kind of a look at the broad range of things that enter into cost of living, and which the index tends to me tries to measure in a representative uh, sort of a way, uh, giving weight, a uh, reasonable relative weight uh, to the array of items. After all, uh, people do spend money for postage stamps and they do spend money for automobiles and uh, with the variation in price, although postage stamps are catching up, uh, there still it wouldn't be appropriate simply to average in the change for both in the same weight, obviously, uh, automobiles cost more than postage stamps. Uh, so that each of the items is weighted in the terms of its own relative importance, and this market basket that is included in this measuring rod of inflation uh, includes 400 items. Now, 400 sounds like a large number, perhaps, but after all, that's only a kind of a drop in this uh, vast bucket of goods and services that are available on the American market. Those 400 items, 100 food items and 300 non-food items, uh, are included in the index in a weighting scheme that not only represents themselves, but also an array of uh, related items that tend 
to move in similar patterns. Now, not to spend uh, too much uh, time on that, but uh, if you look at two and three here, it'll give you a feel for the array. These are just the groups, incidentally, not all 400 items. But on the left hand of page two, we've got things like pork chops and bacon and the, the whole array of things, uh, some of them which create problems for me because I'm an Orthodox Jew and they don't have kosher foods in here. So I don't know how bacon is representing me in the index, but uh, there are other items that do represent my movements. Uh, but they also include in the second grouping there, see food away from home and notice how... Um, um, I'm trying to think of what the proper adjective is. I was going to say, notice how uh, appropriate we are. We, we not only have, in terms of food away from home, restaurant meals, uh, but snacks. Uh, that's to take care of characters like me who are going to eat their lunch driving leisurely up to uh, uh, Grossinger's this afternoon for a big retreat with Secretary Brennan. He's decided to make executives of all of us in the Labor Department. And the meeting started at 9 o'clock, and I was supposed to be there and so I said, I will be there, you know, right after lunch. So I'll have my snack driving leisurely along Route 17. But we cover that because a lot of people do eat that way, unfortunately. Everything is in there. Home purchase, notice further down the line, mortgage uh, uh, rates, hotels, motels. And incidentally, another issue that I want to bring to the fore here is you look down the line of um, page two, the right-hand column, you get the fuel and utilities, there's uh, gas and electricity and telephone rates and so forth. And, you know, mentioning gas and electricity is suggestive of what's coming along soon. Uh, as I want to uh, turn in a moment or two to uh, what has been hitting us, and it's clearly been the food area, it's very likely, in my view, that food prices will slow down in their rates of increases. I suspect you've all noticed that already. But one of the problems in terms of the costs of living is that you're kind of like in the middle of a horse race. Uh, it, um, uh, it is a kind of a whiplash sort of a situation because uh, as one area lets off, another area picks up. Uh, food prices are probably going to slough off, but now we're going to see the uh, mounting increases in some of the rest of the array of the market basket. Gas and electricity prices increases are already in the works, the fuel price increases, and others. Uh, now, over on page three, um, notice the in the service area, the wide array of representation in the index down there on the left-hand side of page three, health and recreation. Uh, I, I don't know, it's the mind of a statistician that brings those two together in one index. We have health and recreation in one index. But look, it's not as funny as it sounds. You don't do much recreation unless you're in good health. Believe me, I can tell you that having just left the hospital two months ago. Anyway, uh, now uh, in there you have not only the drugs and uh, the professional services where we get those obstetrical fees and the costs of hernias and operations and oh, a vast array of interesting and exciting things that do happen to people and enter into their cost of living. Up there on the left come the personal care items. Now, incidentally, uh, I notice right off the bat there men's haircuts. Now, obviously and clearly, relative importance of that ought to have declined. Those columns and numbers on the right suggest the relative importance. Uh, the, um, the items, and uh, if your eye goes uh, down further, you get to beer and whiskey and funeral services. I'm not sure why they're in that order. It, it is not suggestive of anything, really, except that this is, happens to be the array. Um, the, the point I started to make is that this market basket is updated every decade or so. That's not often enough in a dynamic economy. And in fact, right now, it's considerably out of date. The last updating of the market basket was in 1960-61. We went out to 10,000 families and literally sat with them for a while anyway, found out what they spend their money for. Uh, some things you can get information on by recall, like you'll remember when you bought your last refrigerator or made your clothing or what have you. But who really remembers how much they spent for green beans last week and the like? So when it comes to food... We do it on a diary method where we ask families to actually keep a record. 
I must say, I suppose with the high cost of food, it may be easy to remember it this time around. We're doing that kind of a market basket survey now, and uh, the index hopefully will be revised around 1976. As a matter of fact, exactly 1976. I'm not sure whether that's intended to substitute for the bicentennial celebration, which apparently is having some troubles too. We were supposed to get this revision done about four years ago, but there have been some budget problems, the usual excuses that you get from bureaucrats. Now let's turn to page four and having simply taken perhaps too much of a moment to look at the nature of the thermometer, the gauge, you know, what is it we're talking about every time you hear the statistic on living costs? Well, now let's take a look at uh, what has been happening in the aggregate. I, I say it that way because uh, I'm certain I get reports uh, weekly, if not daily, from my wife. I'm certain you folks know exactly what's happened to your cost of living. But uh, these figures reflect, in a sense, you know, the overall picture. First of all, on page four comes through this, this whiplash bit again, this horse race, race bit. Here, looking only over the past year, from August to August, 72 to 73, notice the great diversity in price movements, even during a time of very rapid inflation. Not everything goes up the same time. Certainly, nothing goes down. But uh, from the um, really uh, almost disastrous increase of like 40% in that meat, poultry, and fish category and, you know, individual items and components within it, larger than that, 40%, 36.3 to be exact, of the bar on top of page 4, in relationship to an overall average of 7.6. You see that all items bar in the middle? And if you wonder what are these... Uh, <clears throat> characters that the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics talking about when they report these figures of only 7%, you know you're going out and you're paying twice as much for some items and the like. The um, explanation really is that down there at the bottom, there are some things like public transportation. We managed not to have a subway fare increase this year. Uh, next year, I can't really predict about uh, footwear, reading, and recreation. Uh, private transportation, you know, for a period of time there, we were favoring the automobile industry very substantially uh, with many of our tax policies. And if you included excise tax uh, reductions, there were actually decreases in some cases. So the, the point really of page four is movements in living costs are always an, a wide range. Uh, now, one thing I will say is this. We all tend to feel more seriously food price changes. Because look, the automobile prices didn't go up. Look, I suspect many in these rooms, I, I would guess, I'm only guessing that we probably have a substantial concentration of Manhattanites here who uh, probably uh, buy cars uh, less frequently than the suburban characters and the like may not have bought a car last year, so what good does it do you if car prices didn't go up? It affects the average in the, increase, in the index, but the point is that food prices are a sensitive indicator. They're an emotional figure, frankly. They're the figures that get people uptight about living costs because you shop for food frequently. The impacts of changes hit you quickly. Uh, less rapid changes or more rapid changes in other spending areas simply don't hit you as often. You don't buy clothing as often. You don't fortunately have medical costs as often. You don't buy transportation of a major type as frequently and the like. So, therefore, on page five comes a, a real look at... Um, at what has been, you know, why have we had this enormous uh, uh, reaction to inflation in the last year or two? Uh, certainly well justified. But on top of the reality, we've had, in my view, at least superimposed uh, the additional fact that this inflation of the past year has been very largely concentrated in the most sensitive area of consumer spending, food. Take a look at what I mean on page five, and look, all these bars will drive you crazy. I'll just focus on one or two of them. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, for each category on the left there, food, the all items combined, housing, health and recreation, apparel and upkeep, and transportation, 
Those are the major components for which we report each month. For each category, we have four bars. The one on top is the average increase from 1972 to 73, average annual increase. That is the current year as it is running to date. Shown for comparison purposes, the bar just below it for 71 to 72, and the crosshatched bar for the three-year period, 69 to 71, and then the bottom bar with the vertical lines for the almost decade, 60 to 69. Now, if you look at that array, one thing comes through loud and clear. In terms of this past year, look at that food bit there. It's been concentrated substantially and significantly in food. An 11% increase over the past year in the total food package compared with um, a comparable period just a year ago of 4.5%. It's the rate of speed up too. Uh, that has an impact on how people react. Now, mind you, housing, meanwhile, while still going up, look at the housing group there, the rate has actually gone down from 6 to 5.4. Don't misunderstand, no declines. In my lifetime, uh, in the, looking at these numbers, I have rarely seen declines, and I don't expect to live that long. But rates have changed, yes, somewhat. Health and recreation, similarly, from 3.9 to 3.3, a parallel and upkeep, a small change, 2.1 to 2.2. Two, two. Transportation, 3.1 to 1.9. But food, up like a rocket. Now, furthermore, on page 7, and I'll skip one or two of these because we want to leave time for questions. I think trying to answer your questions will get more at your concerns, perhaps, and even running through all these. But just a couple of more moments on this. Page 7, here, see... The picture comes through very clear. There's the whole market basket, the all items, marching its way. Now, look, beginning in 73, it turns sharply upward. But the food market basket, you know, can you just focus at the very last two or three months there? Frankly, our chart has had trouble drawing that line in such a way that it wasn't going backwards because, you know, it's like going straight up. At that rate of change, we'll all be heading for the moon. And furthermore... On page eight, within the food category, well, with it be, no, the, I was going to say within the food category, but that's nine. On page eight, just like another view, although you can introduce it with the comment within the food category, it's it's the meats, poultry, and fish group. Just look at that. <laughs> you know, it really has been a different ball game. You know, it isn't simply a matter of prices increase like mad. If people have been responding the way they have been, look at the picture on page 8 as you hit the summer of 73. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the pattern becomes uh, almost unbelievable. Uh, the only problem is it's exactly what was happening. Now on page 9, another view. Uh, here, what I'm taking a look at is uh, differential movements between price changes in the uh, items uh, that you buy in food uh, for consumption at home and restaurant meals. Now, first of all, on the left-hand side comes the long-term trend, which has been the explanation for inflation, which has been with us now for, you know, longer than most of us care to remember. See, the top line, the solid line, is food away from home. You know, statisticians jargon for restaurant meals. Remember, that's the restaurants plus the snacks, mostly restaurants. The, the dashed line is the food at home. Now, you see, over the long-term trend, we have been through what the economists got to like to call a cost-push inflation. It was service introductions into our living costs that we're pushing up living costs. You know, you bought a frozen food package instead of standing and chopping the spinach yourself, if anybody's still eating spinach. Uh, by, you know, eating in a restaurant, you're paying for a wage, for a rent, for an electricity, and so on and so forth. And over the long haul, notice how much more rapidly that component had been going up. Uh, it's a, not in relative importance. People still eat mostly at home, but the rate of change, because it was reflecting cost increases. 
But look at the turnaround in the last year. And now listen, uh, first of all, I was shocked by Vivian Siegel's introduction. She said something about, what was it? I had made a note, but she said, good morning, ladies. Listen, in this day and age, but I see the reason for it. Uh, the male chauvinists are going to get back at that. But I was about to suggest that since the audience is so heavily concentrated with ladies, you might want to tear out page nine and take it home tonight. Because if there's anything that's useful in selling your husbands and going out to dinner, just take a look at this one. The whole thing has been reversed in the last year. Because restaurant costs, you know, are less um, flexible because there has been under phase one and two, at any rate, a reasonable degree of control, restaurant meals, the solid line, have gone up less rapidly than the non-controlled agricultural product sector, the food at home. So over the past year, from September 72 to September 73, you've had a complete reversal. There really hasn't been, incidentally, uh, you better hurry up with this and get home fast because uh, my guess would be that, you know, as you tarry by Thanksgiving and Christmas and so forth, uh, this picture will probably have changed again as the, you know, the cost structures catch up. And here comes phase four. Uh, Ms. Siegel asked me to comment on it. See, under phase four, you can pass on cost increases, and this is going to begin to be passed on. And so the two will come into line. So enjoy it while you can. But on page 10, uh, this, oh, forget all that jumble of bars. Let me uh, uh, take my word for what it says. It's really the top set that I want to call your attention. There is one other kind of tragedy, and incidentally, in my view, a great, um, great um, a potential for political concern, social, I, I guess I ought to use that word, uh, social concern in these recent developments with regard to inflation. When the whole market basket goes up, it hurts everyone, no question of it. But when food prices rise so much more rapidly than other elements in the costs of living, who is it that gets hurt most? Obviously, those people whose budget for food represents the highest part of their total spending. Now, which groups are those? Two major groups, the poor and the aged. Notice the array by income class shows the relative importance of food in a family budget uh, because you can only spend so much, and after all, as we learn, as we grow older, you can only eat so much. You can only spend so much for food, and as your income goes up, you, there are limits on your spending for food uh, so that uh, people with less to spend spend a much higher proportion of their total spending for food. And so the poor and the aged, uh, when food prices are increasing as, you know, vertically almost like those charts showed up a while ago, they are really uh, getting hammered much worse than the rest of us. That really is the, the point that comes through from page uh, 10. Now, page 11 introduces another special little note for us New Yorkers. I have been born in this uh, area, lived here all my life, and uh, uh, hope uh, with God's help to go on living here for quite a number of additional years. But there are some problems here. For one thing, living costs are higher here than in most other places around the country. Incidentally, I wouldn't say around the world, having just come back from a trip to Paris this summer, uh, I discovered that I was paying $1.33 every morning for eggs. One egg, not eggs, forgive me. I had to watch the S there, too, because at $1.33, you've got to be careful what you say. But uh, for those of you uh, who are fluent in French, you can understand now why they say one egg for breakfast is enough. Oh, with a pun like that, I ought to quit right there, right? Forgive me. Page 11. Thank you. You're very kind. No one threw one. Anyway... Uh, page 11, I start to look at this issue of, you know, how are things different here? Well, the top of the line uh, there, the top uh, set of bars, rather, uh, New York is the, the lateral one on the right. You see, for whatever period you're looking at, 
it's the rate of increase has been significantly higher here and the two sets of lines by various groups down below uh, without pausing in great detail simply say this whatever category you're looking at and the all items combined the rate of increase here has been faster okay the rate has been faster and and incidentally take a look at page 12 um, that shows up the picture since 69 there has been a tendency for that condition to be aggravated. Look at that gap that has developed in uh, the increase in living costs uh, between here and um, the country as a whole and other parts of the country. But, uh, and, uh, okay, page 14. Let me uh, digress you there quick, too, because I'm going to uh, stop uh, pausing at each one of these where it's repetitive so we can get at the questions and answers. Uh, but page 14, uh, a raise of uh, a number of cities. And incidentally, let me pause one moment. This is not the consumer price index, which only measures rate of change. This is another measure that we have called the city workers family budget, where we do take for a typical family. Uh, it's a statistician's term. Don't even ask me what we mean for it because to buy that because to answer it, I'd have to give you a document this thick that spells out all kinds of specifications and details on it. But in all seriousness, we price a similar budget, not identical necessarily, because after all, do you need uh, the same kind of warm clothing in the South as you do in the North? Incidentally, don't underestimate weather as one major factor for differences in living costs. Listen, look at that page 14 bottom line. Which city has the lowest, uh, you see, living costs with a U.S. average equaling 100? Austin, Texas. I always assumed that when Lyndon Johnson went down there to retire, he must have looked at these figures because it's been the lowest cost living area for as long as I can remember. But the element there really is um, climate. You have to insulate your houses differently, so you build them differently. You don't have to use as much fuel, and just think of what that's going to do to the gap and the differential as we move into this uh, next uh, phase and the like. So here you've got an array of how it uh, shapes up, and in general, if you can look at, uh, look at it with a kind of a general view, the cities on top are the urban, northern, older cities, where, you know, their infrastructures make living costs higher. Uh, if you have to move something two miles in Manhattan from the east side to the west side, think of what that costs a businessman to do. After all, time is money. The amount of time it takes to move it two miles from east side to west side, uh, you know, you go six times around that Dallas airport that they've just built down there the size of Manhattan Island. So consequently, that too becomes a very important element. The high cost areas are the urban northern ones, the low cost ones are the newer southern ones. And that's the generalization that emerges as you look at that set of cities. Well, on page 15, uh, you, um, we, we took a look at that same tool. Maybe I'll just focus at the bottom one quickly. And the differential, even between New York, well, the differential between New York and the five largest metropolitan areas are, you know, all very, very significant. I don't need to pause on those statistics, but you can, you can see the vast array of difference here. And, of course, if you're going to live in smaller non-metropolitan areas, it actually costs less than in the U.S. urban average as a whole. But I suppose uh, my reaction always when I show these gruesome statistics is, uh, in a way, you get what you pay for, of course. And frankly, I wouldn't trade New York for some of the places where you can live for less, live with quotes. But page 18, uh, I want to introduce another in, uh, note of, uh, you know, kind of uh, understanding of what uh, enters into living costs. Now, listen. We tend, when we use the phrase, to think primarily in terms of commodities and things. You know, the things you buy, clothing and food and so forth, and food and food and food. But um, there's another element 
that has developed, especially in the last couple of decades, as spending patterns have changed significantly. Look, uh, we economists have a chap uh, named Friedrich Engels, who we glorify, and we've named a theorem after him called Engels' Law. Only economists would glorify somebody for saying something that every one of our mothers knew, namely that the first dollars you get to spend go for food, clothing, and shelter. You know, it takes a genius to figure that out. And only as you get more money to spend do you spend them in, you know, less essential areas. Well, that has happened, of course. And as uh, influence in America has developed, on the average, I mean, I want to stress that because... uh, uh, the old uh, statisticians bromide uh, about uh, being able to drown in a lake, a uh, statistical lake with an average depth of six inches is also true. And there are a lot of people who didn't share in this affluence. But on the other hand, on average, substantial affluence did develop. And as it did, we did tend to spend more and more in so-called non-essential areas like uh, what health, uh, you know, non-essential, education, uh, protective services as we moved out to the suburbs, for example. A lot of people, uh, friends of mine, moved to Massapequa. They said how foolish you were to buy your house in Queens and New York City, pay those high New York City taxes. That was 21 years ago. Of course, they're paying higher taxes now. It never occurred to them that when they got out there, and they displaced the potato fields and the strawberry patches that with people, they would need hospitals, they would need policemen and firemen, they would need schools and garbage collection. You know, their taxes are higher. Well, think of all these services that I've been mentioning, schools, hospitals, protective services, and so forth. Now, these are things that traditionally in this country, although not necessarily immutably, um, Traditionally, we've bought through the route of government, primarily state and local government. I say not immutably because you know there are discussions ongoing on issues like um, educational vouchers and so on and so forth. And private education has, of course, uh, developed substantially and developed substantial problems too, I might add. But nevertheless, primarily we have bought these services through the route of government. And there is a price also that has increasingly entered into our living costs. Now, look what I mean by that. Take a look at this miserable set of numbers. First of all, a thousand apologies on page 18. I didn't realize that I was going to be talking to you in a dark room, you know, and here are these tiny numbers which primarily uh, measure your visual acuity. And I must tell you, frankly, as I get older, I get less able to read them. If I didn't know them by heart, I'd really have trouble with ups and downs. I can't see them through either end. At any rate, we, on this budget, we do a budget for intermediate level and a lower level and a higher level. You know, what's this, uh, our concept of a higher level? Uh, it isn't a limousine liberal or a Cadillac, you know, this term that developed. In a Nordmobile age, I can define it as uh, what is included there for transportation is we allow this family a weight annually expenses for automob- of transportation for a, what is it now, a a two-year-old used car replaced every four years. That's the higher level, you see. So it's a moderately higher level. But take a look at that higher level, which in total, in the autumn of 72, came in New York, Northeast New Jersey, where it takes more than any place else, to $20,000, that 20165 figure left-hand column. But now look at the right-hand column. What have been the increases from 67 to 72? The total budget's up a third, 36%, 35.6. Now, food is up a mite more, and, you know, recently especially so, obviously, 38.5. But listen, what is the biggest single increase? Taxes. Somebody said it, 51.4%. But... What I try to suggest by way of introduction is don't overlook the fact that this is also a price increase and a service increase. We have just been spending... Now, look, I am not suggesting that government is more efficient or is less efficient. Uh, I have bought refrigerators that didn't work the day after I got them and cars that won't start. I have one right now. 
and I haven't been able to get help from a government agency. You know, I have found efficiency and inefficiency, mostly inefficiency, uh, you know, spread equally throughout our whole world, wherever you turn. Uh, but that isn't really the issue. One reason that taxes have really been taking a substantially greater part of our cost of living. This is right off the top, you see, is that we have been reflecting this shift of affluence, buying more and more in the way of those kind of services that are typically sold through the route of government. Well, so what? Now on page 20 and 21, the denim on of the story, or at least part of it. Uh, if it interests you at all, in terms of what happened over the past year, and in terms of uh, the decline in the purchasing power of the dollar, for every dollar loss in purchasing power, that page 20 shows where, where you lost it. If you're interested in knowing where you lost it, okay, you know, again, that same food story, most of it in food. Uh, page 21, uh, another review of the same thing, and I'm not taking too much time on these now. Uh, $10 in the base period of the index in 1967, uh, to just buy the same, in other words, to stand still on that living cost treadmill, takes just price-wise. Now, remember what I said right at the outset. That means just going on buying those Arrow shirts. Forget moving up to Gantz or whatnot. And I can see for an audience like this, I should have had some different examples. But anyway, I, uh, the, the point is it takes $14, $17 just to buy what a $10 bill would buy. And furthermore, that is more of a treadmill here than in any other of these major places around the country, that New York bit again. Now, I can't help, you know, ending this topic without uh, stopping for a moment on page 23 and 24, because I suggested earlier that, in my view, these recent movements in living costs I think are creating enormous social problems because when food prices go up, they do create more social problems. That was what I was trying to suggest earlier. But additionally, the whole situation. Look, we have noticed that New York City, I, I think noticed through overkill with all the charts I've had in here, that New York City living costs are substantially higher and moving up more rapidly. And I suspect that that came as no news to anyone around the, the room here. But how does that relate uh, to the ability of um, people in this community to live? Now, the notion is that New York is a, um, a vast conglomeration of, um, well, uh, millionaires, or at uh, best or at worst, you know, people who make no less than $50,000 a year. Uh, if you were to pause at that tiny set of numbers on page 23, and please, my suggestion would be do it at your leisure if you have any. Uh, you may keep these, of course. You would find, frankly, that there are a quarter of a million persons working full time and earning under $80 a week, and 642,000 people working full time and earning under $100 a week. Now, I want to leave you perhaps with the question of how do they sustain themselves in this living cost arena that uh, we've been just marching through? And think of what issues that that raises in terms of the social and political climate. And further, on page 24, I hear you can, here comes one of the most troublesome sort of things. Here we take just a typical factory worker in New York, whatever typical may mean here. Now, you know, if you look at the set of bars on top and look at their extreme rights, they seem to be stretching further and further out to the right. Uh, what does that mean? It means that their gross weekly earnings, the second column, have been rising very rapidly, you know, from an average, and that means half earned more of, uh, what, 84 36 in 1960, by 72, it's up to $144.76. Now, you know, a fellow who's doing that well, uh, jumping uh, even from uh, 65 of 97.88 to 144, like $50 more a week, he gets a feeling he's making it. And then comes 
and this I think is the most troublesome thing, the ultimate frustration. Is look at the reality. If you look in those bars, the extreme right and the growth represents a $50 increase, but then if you take off the black part on the right that represents loss in purchasing power, and the, um, the uh, kind of uh, dotted part, which has those taxes, uh, take home, federal, state, and local, and take a look at what's left real take home earnings, his take home dollar and what he can buy for it, what his wife can buy for it. So the reality of that is that uh, he has not jumped $50 from 65 to 72 in real terms, but gone from 78.50 to 79.69. He made it by a whole buck and a half, but wait now, hold it, hold it, not as simple as all that. Perhaps all the discombobulations of the late 60s were not unrelated to the fact that by 1970, he had made it backwards to 76.67. He had lost $2 after a half a decade in real purchasing power. Uh, even though he thought he was getting a $30 increase gross. Then came phase one. Remember August 1971? In my view, it was substantially effective. Notice what happened? A turnaround. There really was an improvement in real earnings from 76 something or other to 77 something or other. It continued into 72 to 79 something or other. But take a look at the bottom three bars which now focus in on the very recent past. The slight gains that resulted from phase one and two really uh, kind of went out the window in phase three. From August a year ago to August of this year, real earnings, I'm sorry, gross earnings up from 136 to 151, you know, big increases in one year. Uh, real earnings uh, from uh, 78, 72 to 78, 36. The treadmill has come back. You know, the treadmill has come back. Uh, further evidence of that, and this one is uh, page 26, and I'm almost at the end of the road. Page 26, we have a silly little measure, frankly. It really is a silly little measure, which some of you may resent. I get more letters of complaints saying, you, I can't repeat it here. Uh, you know, the Sunday dinner. You know, how do you make a Sunday dinner for four people for eight dollars, you know, and so forth, or where do you eat? Uh, actually, it's, um, uh, it's intended really to provide a figure uh, that isn't an index number, and the notion that, uh, based on the notion that most people really don't know how to eat an index number, wouldn't want to if they did. And that a uh, dinner that consists of, uh, you know, a, a, an entree and uh, food that you can taste and feel and sense makes more sense to them. Uh, and of course, we only count the amount that is spent at that one meal, presuming there are a lot of leftovers. So if at the column on the left by August of 73, it's $8, listen, that's for one meal. That means that if you serve that, uh, you know, seven days, that would be uh, close to $60 a week alone. That sounds better than $8, but most people don't think of it that way. But that isn't what I want to call to your attention. Because if we take that dollar figure then for a Sunday dinner, either with a roast beef uh, main entree or a chicken dinner, which less, of course, no chickens catching up, and watch the price of turkeys next week, uh, next month, or whenever it is that Thanksgiving comes this year. You know, with those Monday holidays, I don't know what anything is anymore. Suddenly they sprung October 22nd on me as, as Armistice Day. You know, I, I had a lot of trouble adjusting to that. Uh, Thanksgiving, we're in better shape. That's still Thursdays, I understand. Anyway, take a look, really, not at the left-hand column with the dollars, but the work time. You know, we did here. Said, look, cost so much in dollars to to buy the wherewithal to prepare this dinner, and we also have some numbers on how much an average factory worker earns. So, how much time does he have to work just to earn enough for the one meal and use that as an index? just as a guide, really, a rough guide index of living standards. Now, you want to understand, at least in my view, why people are walking around so utterly frustrated. Take a look at that column that says work time, second from the left. In 1964, when we started this, you know, silly little figure, 
the typical worker in New York had a, you know, his uh, one hour and 50 minutes of work would uh, earn him enough money to buy uh, this uh, roast beef and so on and so forth for Sunday dinner. And despite all the griping and so forth, living standards really did improve because through the years, look, it goes down a dollar fifty, an hour of fifty, an hour of fifty, went down to an hour and thirty nine minutes. Now, you may not get excited as I don't, frankly, either, about eleven minutes less of work to buy the items for a Sunday dinner. But the real point is that, you know, living standards are increasing, and they they go down slowly, don't they? Sixty four to seventy two, almost eight years. By November, December of seventy two. See, further down the line, it's down to one hour and 37 minutes. Actually, I guess it bottomed out where at an hour and 35 minutes in October of 72. Then came the inflation of phase three. And look what happened. You know, we just got like wiped out in terms of all these uh, gains. Uh, by August of 73, the guy is back to where he was in 1964. It's one hour and 56 minutes. He's worse off now, you know, the six minutes versus 11 minutes, so he's working 17 minutes more for one meal. That, that isn't the issue. As an index of I am making it, it really is a disastrous picture in terms of looking at that middle column. And uh, finally, so where does that all leave us? On page 28, uh, one thing you can say about statisticians, they always are left on the last page. But seriously, I bring this into the picture at this stage because inevitably... After a, uh, you know, demonstration of this kind, which uh, proves essentially that uh, the reason the economists are called the dismal scientists is, uh, you know, a well-justified one, I, I don't like to leave it, uh, the, you know, with a complete um, uh, total dreariness. I want to suggest that, uh, uh, that there, are, there are some solutions, obviously, because the question always comes up, uh, so what, you know, so where are we going? Well, suddenly I'm looking at a different set of numbers. Nothing there that says anything about cost of living or what have you. But it's saying something about productivity. Because in a funny sort of way, that really is the basis of, uh, of uh, it really is the base uh, for the, this whole issue of inflation. Uh, we have enormous problems in this country that relate to productivity. After all, after World War II, uh, first of all, we were kind enough to uh, blast the obsolete productive capacities of uh, Germany and Japan uh, out of being during World War II, and then we helped substantially to refinance the uh, building of modern facilities while uh, on our own front, we've had the Pittsburghs and Buffaloes, which are very dreary places if you've been to them lately. The uh, Mohawk Valleys of New York and need you go further than Brooklyn. Have you noticed what's happened to Brooklyn lately? Have you noticed what's happened to jobs lately in New York, for that matter? You know, um, uh, even before cost of living uh, comes this issue of uh, having something to buy with. And uh, New York has lost like uh, 400,000 factory jobs since uh, uh, the early 50s. You know what 400,000 jobs means? It's, uh, it's uh, more people than are employed in all the factories of the whole state of Connecticut. Uh, we've lost the state of Connecticut. And if you think it's only factory jobs in the last um, three years, uh, since the recession that the country went into in 69 and came out of in 71, but which we never came out of. We lost here a quarter of a million jobs. And uh, that's uh, no, uh, no small uh, number either. Uh, that's more jobs in total than all the people employed in the city of Syracuse. We just lost the city of Syracuse in New York in the last three years without anybody noticing it. Uh, what's uh, the point of all that? I, I promised I was trying to get away from the dreary bit, and I guess, you know, we, we have trouble. It's like climbing out of things, and it keeps slipping on you. You know, we're a dreary bunch, and it's hard to get away from it. Uh, but let me get to the bright side, really. The issue is productivity. Uh, wages, I, I referred earlier to the large numbers of persons who uh, earn low rates of pay, and there is a notion 
uh, that really doesn't seem, in my view, to understand the relationship between wages and unit labor costs. The issue is unit labor costs. The issue is how do you produce things at lower costs? Now look, if a worker is earning $100, and you double his wages to $200, that's an increase of 100%. Um, if at $100, he's turning out 100 widgets, whatever the, the, the widget stands for, the unit labor cost, the amount of cost of labor per widget is $1. If at uh, $200, through productivity increases that relate essentially to processes, production methods, technology, machinery, automobile workers at seven or eight dollars or nine dollars are really not more skilled workers than garment workers in New York at three dollars. They just work with a technology that makes them more productive. But if through that uh, technological process the worker is able at, uh, to turn out 200 widgets, uh, uh, 300 widgets at two hundred dollars of wages, and 300 widgets of output, what's the unit labor cost per widget? 67 cents, 66 and two-thirds. Wages have doubled from 100 to $200, and the cost, labor cost, wages are not labor costs. Labor costs have gone down from a dollar to, to uh, 67 cents. Uh, now, look, that's a heck of a lot easier to do here at a microphone in front of this room with widgets than it is in terms of the productive process. Well, look all over our town, for that matter. Look, uh, there's still, uh, Vivian Siegel remembers this example, pushing those push carts just the way they did 30 years ago all over our garment district. If you're going to play in a golf course, you get up, you hit a ball, then you get, uh, in many places, you get into a cart that drives you to hold two. If you're carrying uh, garments from one place to another around 7th Avenue, you drag it by hand. Does that make much sense, really? Is it necessary to step up productivity in golfing? Is that really the issue of the economy? So all I'm really trying to suggest as a closing note is that I'm afraid because the answer, uh, the, I, the concern probably is, where are our economic policies? Is phase three working? Did, did phase three work? Is phase four going to work? I suspect my real point and conclusion is you can't legislate an end to inflation. Oh, I don't mean, don't misunderstand me. In my personal view, I think there are situations and emergency situations that you do have to contend with and deal with with emergency measures. I mean, all of us, I'm sure, are aware of that in our own personal lives. Uh, if your staircases in a, a building aren't wide enough to uh, take everyone in the case of an emergency, you try to set up some kind of control for it. Uh, the ultimate objective is to build a set of arrangements that's less dangerous. The, um, they're, they're the uh, controls of uh, situations and emergencies, obviously and clearly, uh, may be necessary. But really, the question, it seems to me, is where do you go ultimately? And the ultimate answer can only be uh, one of uh, the reduction of costs through productivity increases. And I think we've done so very little, really, about that. Look, final word. Uh, the garment industry of New York. If you try to produce garments in New York the way you do in Hong Kong, can you really be competitive? You know, you can't. Uh, why has America always had the competitive edge up to now? Because our processes have been more productive. Our unit labor costs have been lower, even though our workers have been paid more. That isn't as true, really. It simply isn't as true as it has been. So in the garment industries, for example, where wages are quite low because it's a low productivity industry. It isn't a matter of employers or villains or exploiting or what have you. If we paid, rate, paid rates of pay in the garment industry that we do in automobiles, the industry would just collapse. But what kind of uh, productivity research has been going on? Frankly, in my view, in industries where earnings are uh, markedly lower than average, and where, incidentally, clearly public support is required for dependents, is what do you think uh, when you look at a million and a quarter persons on public assistance, Substantial numbers, you know, there are very few men on there 
despite anything you may read about, it's primarily women and dependent children. Uh, men, many of those men are those folks. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.